turn with me to Jeremiah. I'm going to pick up in our series on Jeremiah where we left off last week in Jeremiah chapter 3, starting in verse 19, and we're going to read into the first four verses of chapter 4. I said, I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful of all nations. And I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. A voice on the bare heights is heard, the weeping and pleading of Israel's sons, because they have perverted their way, and have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, O faithless sons, I will heal your faithlessness. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Truly the hills are a delusion, the orgies on the mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is, salvation of, is the salvation of Israel. But from our youth the shameful thing has devoured all for which our fathers labored, their flocks, their herds, their sons, and their daughters. Let us lie down in our shame, and let, us, let our dishonor cover us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers from our youth, even to this day, and we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver, and if you swear as the Lord lives, in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, <clears throat> Break up the fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire, and burn with none to quench it, because of your evil deeds. Let us pray. Father, we think about Israel, southern kingdom at this time in history, and all the idolatry and wickedness that was there. And we can think about our own nation, our own lives, our own time. And we see so much wickedness that surrounds us. We pray that you would protect us and our children from the evil influences that are around us. Help us to maintain a strong commitment to you and faithfulness to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Philip Ryken introduces this section in his commentary talking about some personal disappointments. He mentioned being newly married and not having much money. He cut out coupons in the back of the cereal box to get some free ice cream treats. And he walked to the ice cream parlor, pockets empty, coupons in a hand. He got to the cash register, and the guy in the white hat told him, oh, we don't make that size anymore. <laughs> and I thought about that, and I remember when I was about five or six years old, the snow cone man would come around our neighborhood ringing a little bell, ding, 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 as he'd go around. And I got a snow cone. It all cost a dime then. <laughs> and, uh, I, I took one lick out of my cherry snow cone and the whole top fell off onto the ground. And I sat there looking at it, I guess it looked pitiful, and the snow cone man gave me another one. <laughs> later, um, he actually was a school teacher, he was a Christian man I learned later, got to know him well. He um, was actually a teacher, and science teacher in school, which I had much later, high school. But, of course, those are minor little disappointments in life that happen. But we all experience big disappointments that come with heartache. Now, you might not get the job you really wanted. You might find that you really hate the career or the job that you're in. Now, you could have a handicap that makes life difficult. You could have prodigal children that are a source of deep concern to you. 
Well, in this passage, God expresses disappointment with His people. In verse 19, I said, How I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful of all nations. And I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Think about what God did. He freed them from slavery in Egypt. He provided for them through the wilderness. He spoke directly to them from Mount Sinai. And then through Moses gave them His law. Of all the peoples in the earth, only this one people had the true law of God. He brought them through the wilderness and brought them to a good land. They were His instruments to bring judgment to the wicked people inhabiting that land. And He warned them not to practice the evil deeds of that people. Don't do all these things. Do the nation occult, practice the idols, other thing that they do. He wanted to love them with a father's love and delight in them as his people. And he did treat them as a beloved son in all the things he did for them, even down through their history. You know, he gave them the land, protected them, gave them victory over their enemies. He wanted all those things. In fact, one writer said he wanted a son like Beaver Queether, and he got one like Bart Simpson instead. <laughs> Well, the imagery shifts back to the imagery of the first few chapters that used about an unfaithful wife. In verse 20, Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. God's people not only were to be faithful, loving sons, they're also compared to a devoted and faithful wife. But they've been acting like cheap prostitutes, committing spiritual adultery with every pagan idol imaginable. And these two verses state that God is a spurned husband and a disappointed father. When we fall into sin, uh, we should not only feel the guilt and sorrow for that sin, but also have the idea that we had disappointed our Heavenly Father. And that's why we need to repent and confess our sins quickly. We want to be able to sing the second verse that we sang this morning, Be Thou My Vision, with full confidence. Be Thou my vision, and Thou my true word. I other with Thee, and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and Thy, the, thou thy, and thy, thy, thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. When we believe in Jesus, one of the great blessings of our salvation is that we are adopted into God's family and have the privilege of calling Him our Father. Same idea mentioned in verse 19. In fact, the Westminster Larger Catechism points out the great blessings of being adopted into God's family. In question 74 it says, what is adoption? It gives the answer, adoption is an act of God's free grace in and for His only Son, Jesus Christ, whereby all those who are justified are received into the number of His children, have His name put upon them, the Spirit of His Son given to them, or under His fatherly care and dispensations, admitted to all the liberties and privileges of the sons of God, made heir of all the promises, and fell heirs with Christ in glory. It's a nice summary of that, but think about what that is, that we could be, call God our Father and we be His children. I talked with many people who grew up with bad fathers. You know, maybe they you know, were abusive, beat them, uh, alcoholics, drug addicts, all those types of things. Uh, one of our students in Ukraine that's now doing really fine work planting two churches uh, he told me, he said, my father gave me my first heroin injection when I was 14. And it took him a while. He had a whole drug history and then came to the Lord and got away from it. But I've talked with people that have had that and pointed out, make a contrast to what God is like as your father. Uh, think about what your earthly father was like and then contrast that to what your 
Heavenly Father is like. That's your real Father in the fullest and truest spiritual sense. I found that that often helps people heal from some of those things. If you believe in Jesus through your salvation, all that that I just read applies to you. And this is a motivation against sin and grieving the Holy Spirit and our Heavenly Father. We also see in this that sin is destructive and makes life bitter. Verse 21, a voice on the bare heights is heard, the weeping and pleading of Israel's sons, because they had perverted their way and have forgotten the Lord their God. Some commentators see this as the beginning of Israel repenting for idolatry. However, they're still standing on the bare heights, which were places of idolatry. One way to interpret the bare heights is to take the phrase in regard to Josiah destroying the idols that once stood there. And now the high places are barren. The idols have been stripped away. Remember in 2 Chronicles 34, 3, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, speaking of Josiah, he began to seek the God of David his father, and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim and the Card and the metal images. The people of Judah were focused on these idols. These acts were probably not very popular with the people. People could go back to their places of idolatry in the high places, and they were nothing more but barren hilltops. The idols were smashed and destroyed or burned. They couldn't worship their, their false gods anymore. They were bitter and weeped and cried about their gods. And their sin was making them bitter. Calvin wrote that these prayers did not arise from faith, but simply that they were such lamentations as betoken misery and wretchedness. And sin brings bitterness and distress. It promises some kind of fulfillment and satisfaction, but it brings misery. The tears mentioned in verse 21 may have been the tears of grief over the loss of their idols, and not tears over their true repentance. When we think about repentance, we can think of two ideas, attrition and contrition. Attrition is essentially being sorry you got caught. It's not a real sorrow for the transgression. And every parent knows examples of this. You know, a mother goes into her kitchen and sees her little boy with his hand in the cookie jar when he was told not to. And she grabs him out and he knows he's going to get it. And he goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, that's a good example of attrition. <laughs> R.C. Sproul wrote, attrition is a false or spurious kind of repentance. It involves remorse caused by fear of punishment or loss of blessing. Not really a sense of sorrow toward God. In our Christian lives, contrition is a true godly sorrow for the sin and motivates us toward God and forgiveness. We read earlier the passage in 2 Corinthians 7, 8 to 11, and look with me at that passage again. Remember that Paul had written to the Corinthians and given them rebukes for various problems, and apparently there had been some positive response. So there, even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, though I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a little while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. For so see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to queer yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment, 
At other points you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. They had a godly sorrow, a true repentance or contrition. The Westminster Confession, again talking about repentance, says, By it, repentance, a sinner out of the sight and sense, not only of the danger, but also the filthiness and odiousness of his sins, as contrary to the holy nature and righteousness of the law of God, and upon the apprehension of his mercy in Christ, to such as are penitent, so grieves for and hates his sins, as to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. There's a, basically a definition of contrition. The contrite person confesses his sins, doesn't attempt to rationalize it or make excuses for it. This is the attitude of David in his great psalm of repentance in Psalm 51.10 when he prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and a right spirit within me. And there, verse 18, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Jeremiah 3.21 shows the despair of the godless society. In his lectures, Death in the City, Francis Schaeffer concluded that the so Christian culture, a godly, you know, God's people culture of Jeremiah's day was disintegrating into a post-Christian culture. In fact, in many ways it already was at this time. And he was applying that to the present culture in the United States. These early chapters of Jeremiah are especially about a culture that has forgotten and left the true God and is discovering the bitterness of life without Him. In this regard it addresses what happens to everyone who is apart from God or abandons God. We can see this in our culture. I mentioned last week that when a society removes God, often it turns to statism, looking to government to meet their every need. This is often what drives, moves towards socialism. We also see this in modern art. One example I think is particularly vivid is Edward Munch's painting, The Scream. Perhaps you've seen it. There's a wraith-like figure, stands on a bridge holding his ears and howls in agony at the world. Another example from literature is T.S. Eliot's poem, The Hollow Men. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Or Jean-Paul Sartre's description of life as anguish, hopelessness, and despair. Apart from God, life doesn't work. Augustine's famous statement is true, that you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. When we believe in Jesus for salvation, when we understand that we have the truth of God and the reality of things given to us in His Word in the Bible, God's Word provides for us a world view that corresponds to reality. We have a basis of truth that corresponds with what God says is true. We aren't left with speculation about eternity or ethical issues. Think about what a tremendous blessing that is. I've heard people talk about, well, I really don't know what will happen when I die. I, you know, hope for the best or hope this, and usually it's always something wonderful I'll have. Not too many people think, well, I wonder if I'll go to hell. <laughs> you don't usually hear that. So, Francis Schaeffer used to say that a man holding a Bible has a base to evaluate the entire culture around him. Walter Kaiser comments about the Northern Kingdom this time had been taken into captivity by the Assyrian Empire. He said, what mercy and grace northern Israel experienced only it had it all turned, uh, to be turned aside. It's hard to imagine what more God could have done to rescue that generation. 
In like manner, we as a nation, we as a nation are coming perilously close to being unresponsive despite years of mercy and grace. What will we say to our Lord in that day for having flaunted all His gracious acts to us as well? Of course God is gracious. The payday must come someday when there is no change in our ways. We also see this text calls God's people back to Himself. Four times in this passage God calls His people back home. His grace invites them to Himself. If we look at verse 12, back we saw last week, it says, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look in you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. In verse 14, Return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am your master. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and will bring you to Zion. And then now in verse 22, Return, O faithless sons, I will heal your faithlessness. In chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things in my presence, do not waver. And if you swear as the Lord lives, in truth and justice and in righteousness, then nations shall bless themselves in Him, and in Him shall they glory. In your life, do you relate to some of the indictments against Judah? Have you ever been like the unfaithful wife or prodigal son in your relationship with God? Might not have been an idol of stone or, or wood, precious metals, but is there something that has become a, the focus of your life apart from God? God calls you to repentance and restoration to Him. God is like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. Remember in that parable how the younger son demanded his inheritance. And he got it, you can imagine packing everything up and going to the far country. And he squandered his inheritance. And then a famine came on the land. And no one gave him anything, the text says. He hired himself out to feed the pigs. Imagine that to Jewish ears. Not only is here's, here's a forbidden animal, he's also feeding it. And then he wants to eat the carob pods that the pigs would eat. Just so hungry. Here was a Jewish young man not only feeding the unclean animal of the pig, wanted to eat its food. And the text says he came to himself and realized that his father's servants were better off than he was. He decided to go back home. He prepared a little speech to say to his father, I will rise and go and say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And I can imagine him on his way back rehearsing that, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. Just let me be like one of your servants. Says it to himself over and over. Here he is coming up the, the road, and the father sees him. And the parable says he runs to meet him. Of course, he's covered with the mud from the pig pen, and the father throws his arms around him, embraced him, and he kisses him. And he gives his little speech. I sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just let me be like one of your servants. The father doesn't even hear him. Luke 15, 22 says, But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. The ring on his hand was like a credit card. He could go to the marketplace, stamp it and wax, buy anything the father's name would buy. The, only the sons would wear the robe and shoes and those things. And I've talked with people through the years who felt like this prodigal son. They felt very alienated from God because of some bad path they had taken. Here's the father running to meet him and embracing him. 
here are these people who are caught up in an every type of idolatry imaginable and God says return to me and I'll embrace you. A friend of mine heard a sermon on the prodigal son once. He wasn't a prodigal himself at the time but he had a kind of the concept of his Christian life that kind of fluctuated. His father had kind of given his love up and down toward him. Uh, his approval was earned. He said, I, it totally changed my life to hear that, think about that parable. He said, I saw God as a gracious father. I was adopted into his family. He was throwing his arms around me and loving me. It really changed the entire direction of his life. One man told me one time, I'm too bad to come to Jesus. Later, he did hear the gospel. He was saved. He realized that I can come. And he did. Perhaps you just remember those early times in your salvation when you experienced the joy of your salvation, that new exuberance, but now you feel like you've drifted away from God. And He calls for you to return to Him just like He called to His people here. And then in verses 22 to 25 in Jeremiah 3, Return, O faithless sons, I will heal your faithlessness. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Truly the hills are a delusion and the origins of the mountains. Truly the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. But from our youth the shameful thing is devoured all for which our fathers labored, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. Let us lie down in our shame and let, us, let our dishonor cover us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, and we and our fathers from our youth even to this day, and we have not obeyed the voice, obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. This prayer shows some important points concerning the nature of repentance. First, the prayer does recognize who God is. Not recognizing God as the true God was at the heart of Judah's problem of idolatry. The phrase, the Lord our God, is repeated four times in this prayer of confession. It points to a personal relationship with God. He is the Lord our God. There is the goal of the confession of the restoring a course of love of the relationship with God. Another aspect of this is recognizing God as the Lord of salvation. We confess that He is the Lord of salvation in verse 23. When we think about the gospel, Jesus made it clear that He is the only way to salvation. John 14, 6, that I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He gives a universal negative. Second true repentance acknowledges how sinful sin is. This prayer admits their worship of idols has been false. It's also been costly. Their idol worship has cost them their, some of their flocks and herds and sacrificed to their objects of delusion. And even worse, they had lost their sons and daughters in their false worship. They would sacrificed their children to idols, which is particularly true of the worship of Moloch. Verse 24, from our youth the shameful thing is devoured all through which our fathers labored. It's not surprising they lie down in the shame. They are humiliated in their sin. Third confession also acknowledges they have lived their whole lives in disobedience to God. Verse 25 mentions that. This confession even extends to acknowledging the sins of their fathers. Now all this contains the elements of real repentance. And this all seems like a sincere and true repentance. However, as we know from the history of Judah, it was a false repentance. They didn't follow through on their words. They said the right things. The right attitudes are expressed. The words are not truly from their hearts. 
fact, all through Jeremiah's life, the idolatry continued until they're taken into exile. And God tells them if they follow through with what they said, He would bless them. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4, If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things to my presence and do not waver, and if you swear as the Lord lives in truth and justice and righteousness, the nations shall bless themselves in Him, and in Him shall they glory. If you do these things, the nations will call them blessed. God tells them then to break up the fallow ground of their hearts. In verse 3, For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. They are to obey Him from their hearts and not just mouth words. They are to watch out for the weeds or aspects of falsehood that would creep in. The same thing is said in different words in verse 4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire, and burn with none to quench it because of their evil deeds. Well, historically, that's what happened. The invading Babylon army wiped out their cities and took them captive. Now, this shows that circumcision was not just a national badge of Israel. It really points toward what was to be a true faith and true repentance of the heart. Philip Ryken pointed out that he wants more than just circumcised Israelites. He wants circumcised hearts. And he wants more than just baptized Christians. He wants baptized wives. If they don't follow through on their words of repentance, judgment will surely come. Under Josiah, the idols were cleansed from Judah. As soon as Josiah was killed in battle in, in uh, 509, went right back to idolatry. Walter Kreiser comments, but little of these outward signs of change touched the personal lives of the general population. Or if they did, it was only an outward mask for deep contrary feelings of abandonment from Yahweh, the Lord, and His world. This section ends with a solemn warning. We spent quite a bit of time last year in the Sunday School class looking at the warning passages in Hebrews. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. I think it fits the warnings given to the people of Judah. In Hebrews chapter 1, the deity of Christ is set forth very clearly. And chapter 2 starts with, therefore, a conclusion idea. Because of the majesty and glory and rule of Christ, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such, great, such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Drift can imply inattention and apathy. Imagine maybe fishing from a canoe and it's a lazy afternoon and you take a little nap and the canoe just drifts down and you awake and you might be a mile from where you put in. When God's people neglect the means of grace, the commitment to the Lord, they can gradually drift in that way. And the warning is very strong. God has spoken to us now through His Son. He says, God never compromised His law. And everyone who broke His law received a just retribution. If God never did that, He's certainly not going to compromise or set aside the words spoken by His Son incarnate. 
said, so watch yourselves. Don't drift. Now he has spoken the final word through his son. There's no other way of salvation. And the text warns us there is no escape if we neglect the salvation that is in Christ. The people of Judah said a lot of the right words and went right back to their sin. We are to have a strong commitment toward Jesus and not waver or drift. If you're not in Christ, this text also warns you that there is no other way of salvation and there's only one true God and you are to throw yourself in faith upon Jesus and trust in Him alone for salvation. Let's pray. Father, we see this people that had all these blessings given to them and basically absorbed the culture around them and became like the Philistines and the Hittites and all the people they had used to live in the land, Jebusites and so on. We are aware that we live in a culture where we are surrounded every day by people who do not know you, who exalt their sin. You think about Romans 132 where they not only know the ordinance of God, the commandment of God, they ignore it and they also give strong approval to those who practice the same things. We pray that you would guard our hearts, help us to be strong in terms of ethics from your word, and that what we hold to would truly be true from scripture. Pray that you protect us from idolatry and various thorns. In Jesus' name.